So, let's be honest. The announcement of 12 of Europe's biggest clubs forming a breakaway European Super League during the 2021 lockdown was one of the most shocking moments in an already extremely unpredictable sport. There was all but universal fan disgust to the idea, with 9 of those 12 clubs swiftly backtracking their position with the proposal fizzling out into nothingness as quickly as it arose. However, a December 2023 ruling by the European Court of Justice declared UEFA and FIFA's blockade of the Super League was unlawful, rekindling the organisers of the competition with the support of the two Spanish giants to announce a new and improved Super League format. Over 15 significant European clubs have backed the new Super League. However, to date, none of the Premier League's big six have, with the future of the competition being unclear. In this video, I'd like to analyse whether it's inevitable that Europe's elite will break away from the game's governing body and whether it is as bad as the media makes it out to be. Only moments after the European Court of Justice's decision was announced, A22 Sports Management, the organisers of the Super League, released a promotional video showcasing their new Super League format, which focused on supposed sporting merit. The main criticism of the original Super League was the Americanization of the structure, which had been a fear of football fans since the surge of American ownership in European football in the early noughties, with three of the five executive leaders of the competition being American. The Super League, which marks itself as a competitor to UEFA competitions rather than domestic leagues, initially proposed a closed league, where the 12 founding clubs would maintain a constant position in the competition, regardless of their performances in either the domestic leagues or in the Super League itself. The universal fan hate this elitist structure faced was clear, and any attempt the Super League could make to evoke fan support with a new proposition would require sporting consequences to be at the epicentre of the structure. The marketing material for the new Super League shows that the organisation recognised this as a crucial touchpoint. A22 wants to create the world's most exciting club football competition. Our proposal aims to ensure competitive tension throughout the year. Our proposal is built around sporting merit. Promotion, relegation and exit from the competition happen each season. Nonetheless, they can talk as much as they want about sporting merit but if it isn't actually backed up with the format, it's pointless. So let's go on to the format. A22 proposed a three-division structure consisting of 64 clubs from across Europe, with the divisions having the not-so-creative names Star, Gold and Blue. The Star League consists of 16 clubs split into two groups of eight. Each team plays every other team in their group home and away for a total of 14 games against other European giants. The bottom team from each group is then relegated to the Gold League for the following season, whilst the top four teams from each group qualify for the knockout round, where the Super League will follow the same structure of the Champions League, with two-legged quarter-final and semi-final matchups before a final on neutral ground. The Gold League will follow the same structure of 16 clubs, with the finalists taking the place of the two relegated sides in the Star League. The Blue League is structured slightly differently, with there being four groups of eight rather than just two, with the top two teams from each group qualifying for the knockout round, whilst 20 of the 32 clubs in the Blue League will be replaced by other clubs from across Europe based on so-called domestic performances. There is no further explanation of how these 20 teams will be selected from across Europe's 48 footballing nations, with A22 Sport yet to mention if all European nations will have the capacity to qualify for the Super League. Before I'm able to analyse this Super League structure, we should first talk about The term agenda gets whipped around the football discourse all the time, however not many people truly understand what the word means, defined as the underlying intentions or motives of a particular person or group. The complicated and extremely lucrative industry of football ensures that all stakeholders hold one, especially regarding a potential billion dollars of revenue the Super League would generate, with true neutral and unbiased opinions being hard to find. But let's talk about different parties' agendas in regard to the Super League, starting with... No party's response is more affected by their own agenda than UEFA's. The governing body has held a monopoly over inter-European competition since the beginning of the European Cup in the 1950s, and their club competitions in non-Euro years represent their main sources of income and profit, 
with the 2022-23 accounts showing that 202 million euros of their 227 million euros profit coming directly from their men's club competitions. So regardless of whether the Super League offered fans an unquestionably better product than the Champions League, you would see UEFA president Alexander Sefran make comments like this. I cannot stress more strongly at this moment UEFA and the footballing world stand united against the disgraceful, self-serving proposal we have seen in the last 24 hours from a select few clubs in Europe that are fueled purely by greed above all else. Therefore, it's crucial that any claim or accusations UEFA make regarding the Super League is taken with a lot more than just a grain of salt, as the whole organisation relies on a lack of competition to thrive. The biggest sport broadcasters in the UK were one of the most vocal detractors of the Super League, with their not-so-obvious agenda being crucial to understanding the dozens of videos plastered across their social media platforms in 2021. In 1992, English top division sides broke away from the Football League to form the Premier League, with Rupert Murdoch's Sky playing a massive role in the new product. Sky had never held rights to English football prior to the Premier League, but were happy to fork out £304 million for a five-year deal. The company had no moral qualms regarding the game's long-standing governing body losing significant power and the inevitable financial gap between the Premier League and Football League continuing to grow to where it is at today, as they saw the potential billions of pounds of revenue they could make. So now three decades on, when a different yet not so dissimilar situation arises in the Super League, Sky is happy to spread so much negative coverage of the Super League as they can, as the Super League has stated a desire to broadcast their product through streaming avenues rather than traditional TV broadcasters, a move which has the capacity to cripple Sky's stranglehold over sports broadcasting in the UK. With Sky and other traditional broadcasters having clear motives and agendas to keep things just as they are. The previous two parties have given great examples of the prime motivator of agendas, that being money, with the Super League clubs being no different. These clubs who bring so much value to the Champions League feel like UEFA and the smaller clubs from the minor European leagues are profiting off their brands, with the group stages where you see teams that are much weaker than mid-table Premier League clubs playing the top teams being seen as pointless and outdated to these billionaire owners. The Super League clubs have a clear agenda to make more money and have even more power over European competitions, and the Super League promises them this. Many clubs across Europe and the Premier League made statements like this damning the Super League when it was originally proposed. Everton is saddened and disappointed to see proposals of a breakaway league pushed forward by six clubs. Six clubs acting entirely in their own interests. Six clubs tarnishing the reputation of our league and the game. Six clubs choosing to disrespect every other club with whom they sit around the Premier League table. Six clubs taking for granted and even portraying the majority of football supporters from across our country and beyond. These statements were correct and represented the views of the majority of fans around the world. However, if you offered Everton owner Fared Mashuri a week prior an opportunity to compete in the Super League, he would have accepted, if you like it or not. The club owners of almost every club in Europe, maybe outside of Germany, agenda is solely set around maximising their revenue, with their position on the Super League almost always being set around whether they've been invited or not to the competition. Therefore, as I go in to analyse the net benefits and drawbacks of the Super League from a fan's perspective, it's important to understand these clubs' agendas will supersede any fan perspective in clubs' decision making. The unfashionable angle to look at with the Super League is its positives, and there are more than you would think. Firstly, A22 have committed to streaming every game on a new digital streaming platform, free of charge, making an important step away from the current landscape where it feels like every competition is on a different channel, with it costing genuinely hundreds of pounds each year to legally watch your team. Making football affordable and easy to watch is undoubtedly a major benefit of the Super League. The other positives regarding the Super League are more subjective than this one, however. I think you could argue that taking power away from UEFA, who have a history of corruption, is quite good, and ensuring that there are more games between teams of similar quality as a benefit. 
but I don't know. It could get quite boring seeing the same elite teams play each other each year, rather than the excitement you get as a fan when you get that Barcelona in the Champions League every four or five years. So let's move on. There's a lot to get through here, so I'm going to try to get through it as quickly as I can. The talk about sporting merit is great, but 14 of the 16 teams in the top division will remain each season. And if smaller clubs have a great domestic season like a Leicester or a Girona, they won't be rewarded with qualification for the top European football. It will have a massive impact on domestic leagues as they rely heavily on marketing battles of top four and top six with teams like Aston Villa, Tottenham and Manchester United having nothing to play for domestically for the remainder of this season if the Super League was present. Halving the size of Europe's top tier will lock out probably every team from minor European leagues, which will make the gap between the top five leagues and the rest even bigger. The guaranteed European football for the top teams every season will only prevent the already low unpredictability of the sport. And that's not even to mention how we don't know yet how A22 Sports plan to distribute revenue between clubs competing in the Super League. Finally, the finals will have to play 19 tough European matches, just adding to the fixture congestion crisis and just making it even more expensive to be a match-going fan in the 21st century. The new Super League format is an embarrassment which just achieves the same objectives of the original one in new packaging, ensuring financial and football security for Europe's elite and making it almost impossible for new clubs to challenge the establishment. It offends the intelligence of football fans that they thought they would get away with this new rebrand without people realising what they were trying to do. However, I do think it's inevitable that Europe's elite will gain even more and more power, whether that's through a breakaway league or through a restructured Champions League, it doesn't really matter. The new Champions League format from next season is already moving in that direction with there being more games between top teams in the group stage, even more total games and two top leagues getting a fifth Champions League spot each year to increase the likelihood of each team qualifying for the competition. This new format is also really bad from a fan's perspective and I could make a whole video on that itself but in the long term UEFA will continue to bend to the will of the elite clubs as they rely so much on them to gain revenue. Within the not so distant future the Champions League will almost certainly look more like what the Super League proposes today than what the Champions League looked like 20 years ago. With the probability of clubs being able to consistently challenge the establishment becoming more and more unlikely as each year goes on without financial doping.